Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome to a conversation worth having. I am so grateful you are here, whether you're here live or later. I am so grateful for you. And today, I am so grateful for my sweet friend, Susan, who I met, I don't even remember how many years ago. It feels like a lifetime, but I don't think it was that long. <laughs> um, probably other lifetimes, though. Uh, but here we are today. And I just, before I get Susan to introduce herself, I want to share something about what inspired this conversation. And uh, with all of the stuff going on in Canada and probably other places too, I'm just really aware of it here in Canada, uh, where the unmarked graves are being found at former residential schools and all the things, all the things that is just, yeah. And I wonder as a white person, <laughs> What can I be and do different? And whether you're white or you're alien or you're whatever watching this, I just wonder what else is possible for each one of us to look at that for ourselves and, and in, in a way that can create greater. And so as I was looking at having this conversation, knowing I can't have it by myself, I don't have the experiences, I don't have the information, I, I wondered who could contribute that. And Susan popped into my mind right away. And it was partly because of the energy that she bees and the gift that she bees on the planet. And partly was I had made a post about a month ago when they first found the first um, site in BC. And Susan had commented on it saying that she'd sat with many residential school survivors and listened. And that really, really spoke to me. And I just wonder, I wonder what else is possible with all of this. And I wonder truly what we can be and do different to change this. Yeah. So Miss Susan, can you please introduce yourself? Hmm. Susan Yaskoween. And uh, I'm just saying in Lakota, Hey, all my relatives, um, I'm Susan, and I am uh, a former resident of Canada. I, I married a Canadian, and so I got up there, but I was born in San Francisco and grew up on the East Coast, and, uh, and I, boy, it's kind of a shit show early on in my life. Uh, my... Um, my mom is Lakota from South Dakota, and, uh, and my dad's uh, kind of a, a British Isles mutt, um, like so many. And so I'm in, in Lakota, the kind of person, you know, the of coming together of the two different kinds of people is, uh, is called Ieska, and it literally means talks white. Um, and... And that's just an interesting thing. And having spent time with a woman who is my, my medicine teacher, who is from a different First Nations background, uh, Micmac and British Isles, um, she just talked about the need for a bridging, you know, between the, the, the different ways of, of perceiving the world. And when you, I don't know how many of you are bilingual or multilingual, but you probably know that when you speak a different language, you, there's a different way of looking at things and perceiving things. And so I've had the gift of being able to, you know, look like I look and, uh, and being raised around white people. Dude, I was surrounded as a little kid with my grandmother in Virginia, south of the Mason-Dixon line. I was a Southern white Roman Catholic looking like this. And that was like, you know, what? And, um, and my mom, she just couldn't stick around because she had all this unresolved pain and suffering that she just never dealt with. You know, back in the thirties, it was still going on hardcore. And, uh, like in South Dakota, there's even photos you can find on the inter in the webs of, uh, like outside of business would say no dogs, no Indians, you know, it was that kind of world. And so she grew up in that. And, um, and then you probably, some of you may be aware of the missing and murdered women, 
um, indigenous women and and in that world just this different world view of of the lack of value of of indigenous women and so my mom and my dad met in the 50s and then they had me and she you know her medicine of choice really was alcohol and um because there was a lot of pain a lot of hurt there and she just didn't know how to deal with it and and then she kind of disappeared and so my dad took me to live with his mom in virginia and i was looking around at all these people and what was what i was seeing and what i was experiencing and going i know something else is possible but i was not seeing it you know and and i was i tried to be a devoted little catholic girl you know and i was I loved, I loved the love stuff. You know, when they talked about love, I was right there, but all the other stuff, it just fried my brains. I couldn't, there was a big mismatch between what was being said and what was being shown. And so I got busy trying to learn about healing and I went through every direction you can imagine. But as a child, the only places that I felt really comfortable was basically in in nature anywhere in nature because what i realized later was that she just accepted me and i didn't have to be anything other than i what what i was and i didn't even know what that was but i just knew that i could have some peace in nature and so it took me years and years to find anybody who was native you know first nations um out where I was staying in in Vancouver mainly, um, you know, I could get on the bus and, you know, I'd see a native person and they'd go, and I'd go, you know, and we just, I'd just see them, you know. But in Virginia, I met three people in 12 years who self-identified as American Indian. And the idea back then was it was like the vanishing Indians somewhere out there, there's a few left, I don't know, you know. And, um, And so coming to the West and finding my teacher and finally getting to connect with Native people was just this huge awakening and and wonderfulness for me. Um, But there was just always this, you know, I I learned about it in, in where I grew up in California the first few years and then in Virginia. You know, all these negative things about Indians, you know, the lazy Indian, the slovenly Indian, the loser Indian, the, you know, all this stuff. And it was just so strange because I knew something else was true and knew something else was possible. So fast forward and I get up to Canada and, and I've been, you know, prior to that, spending time with my medicine teacher and learning um, ceremonies and, and learning this other way that was just it was just like coming home you know when I first learned about the medicine wheel I just heard the words I read the words and I was like oh that's for me that's my thing but I never I it wasn't like because no my mom never talked about that kind of stuff because she was gone so So in 1988, I connected with this organization in Vancouver, British Columbia, and I started working with them first as a volunteer, and then I wrote a a, a proposal that um, was accepted through I don't know even what it's called now, but it's basically the the part of the Canadian government that works it's has has to do with with work and helping people get back to work and and so i had this program and there are all these beautiful native women who showed up but they were all troubled they were trying to get back into the workforce and this program was going to help them become child and youth care workers um and uh i worked with the douglas college and now they have an actual aboriginal stream to their child and youth care worker program. But this was the first one that I I knew of in Canada and certainly in Western Canada. And so we did that. But man, these women, they were bright and they were beautiful, but we were hitting walls of what is going on? There's something going on. 
and little by little they'd start to open up to me and tell me about all this trauma they experienced as children but they couldn't really talk about it much and i learned later from a jewish friend of mine that the Holocaust survivors didn't talk about their experiences and their children and their grandchildren knew something had happened, but they didn't know what. And so I started working with, um, um, we started working with this fellow from who was in Lethbridge at the time. And we started these healing ourselves in our communities gatherings and people were coming from all over Canada and from the States and even from like us, um, New Zealand the Maori people were showing up over time. And it was um, to, to support people in having a safe place to talk about what they'd been through. And we did lots of healing circles and talking circles and also healing processes and things and ceremonies, pardon me. And, and people would sit in circles and talk about what they'd been through. And sometimes their children or their grandchildren would be in the circle and the tears would just be flowing and flowing and flowing. And sometimes people couldn't even talk, but that we would just sit with them, you know, as they listened with each other and from the heart. And these children and grandchildren would just say, oh, my God, I always knew there was something there, but they just couldn't talk about it, you know, and so. So just imagine like being a little tiny kid and you're taken away from everybody you know and you're just told everything about you is wrong. You are wrong. And it's not just how you look, you know, but what you are is wrong. And to grow up in that milieu and then maybe you get to go back to your folks and maybe you don't but i even heard stories of people who like half of the siblings would be taken to the catholics and the other half would be taken to the anglicans the catholics would learn french the anglicans would learn english they'd come back together and they couldn't understand each other because they weren't allowed to even speak their language so a lot of them forgot it not all of them you know but a lot of them did so i'm telling you this you know it's not about oh let's feel horrible about this because that's that's not really helpful you know i mean yes tears are good and it's you know i call it my heart is leaking out of my eyes you know because because <laughs> it's like you know my heart is aware of stuff and if there's sadness i can have you know this experience of sadness but it's not a place to live it's a place to it's like a spark like anger it's a spark to say there's something not quite right here. What do I need to do about it? And what action can I take? What choice can I make here? And so I'm, you know, kind of given like a, a quick little, you know, snippet into this. So I think, you know, as far as things that we can do to support, the first thing is just to acknowledge what is and what, what really happened. And there's lots more resources out there to learn um, as Canadians, you've got the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that, you know, with the 94 recommendations of which only 10, 10 out of 94 have been even touched. Um, so like some education around what did happen um, and kind of like the Me Too movement is just to believe people, like just to believe, like I, I know you might not even have the words for it, but I believe you went through hell and I may not be able to do one damn thing about it, but I can be with you in that. And I can um, just acknowledge what is and acknowledge the greatness of who you are. Um, and know that you, you know, you came from a strong lineage of people who did so much to make it through so many hardships, um, you know, pre-contact and pre-electricity and pre, you know, all this stuff and look at, you know, you, you know, I always say that when I work with first nations people, it's like, you're the ones who your ancestors made it, you know, and you have all the strength and, and now what, you know, now what would you like to create and choose, you know, beyond all of this other crap. And, 
And I think the big thing too is that people have had to push it down and muffle it. And I mean, I know at one point when I was a little kid, when my dad had left me with these people who were supposed to look after me and the guy was a rageaholic and he would beat the ever living shit out of me. And, and he just told me like, if you talk about this, I will kill you. And when you're a little tiny kid and there's this big person you know, towering over you, beating you up, I believed him. <laughs> you know, there was no reason I had not to. So I couldn't even tell my dad. And, and I just learned like, that and so you can imagine when you 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 hear about kids getting beaten or you know all these other abuses they believed them you know and and you just learn to be quiet so so for people to even be able to say what they've been able to say so far is is big and um susan can i just yeah. ask a question yeah, yeah, about please. that um and guys, listening, please ask your questions. If there's anything that you would like to ask Susan, feel free to, to post them there and, and I'll refer them to her. Or if you're watching later on, you know, we can tag her in them if she's got some, some um, awareness with it. So, you know, when you talk about just being with somebody who's sharing, or maybe they're not even sharing, they're just they're just being with what was and what occurred and and maybe even what is i mean i know we're talking about stuff that occurred in the past and there's a lot that's still occurring in lots of other ways and so when you talk about just being with somebody um could you say more to that like how how do you be that because i know a lot of times our reaction is to fill the space is yeah. to tell them it'll be okay it's like we don't like feeling uncomfortable so we attempt to stop what they're going through and i would just love your mm. your experience with how to actually be that with somebody yeah well you know thank you for that question glenice because it's true you know we all our caring hearts just want people to feel better and of course we want to feel better um and it's not easy to sit with somebody and 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 because, you know, oneness is a thing, you know, it's real, we're in that with them. And, and even when we're, we're doing the, the healing training programs that we were doing, one of the things was like, when you're in a circle with somebody and they're starting to cry, don't be throwing tissues at them, you know, like, it's just sit there with them. And, and so we, you know, practice having tissues all around the room and then just let let somebody sit there you know with the dripping and then when there's a moment and you'll know if you're really attuning with that person you know just kind of slide the tissues over to them and if they want them they'll pick them up you know but you don't have to be like you know tissues coming from every side going okay you know because it's it's like a subliminal message of like oh they can't handle my tears i better shut them down again and yeah. so it's yeah, because we're just that tuned in. So for me, what I practice is, because um, I, I use so many tools, as you can imagine, but some of the tools I really love that are so easy are the tools of access consciousness. And one of them is just to drop your barriers, you know, just to drop those barriers and then let your ex energy expand out, you know, right to the edges of the ever expanding universe. And from that space of the space that you be, you can just be there and and if you start yourself feel feel yourself contracting again you just have another breath and then just let that go and expand out you know and not in that big like i just did you know because people will be aware of that <laughs> breath and they'll think oh no now i'm being too much and i've got to shut it down again but just you know surreptitiously just you know breathe quietly and be expanded and so because if if i can be in my body you know, and with my body and just go, body, are, are we okay? You know, we're not, we're not getting beaten right now. Are we? No. Okay. And, and okay. So I can, I can be here. Maybe if you need to put your hand on your tummy and just go, okay, I'm, I'm here. I'm okay. I'm breathing. It's all good. And then, you know, if there's a moment with the person, just ask, you know, is there anything else besides sitting here with you that I could offer you right now? You know, 
and and just ask them, you know, and and let it be okay if if they say no or or yes, but I don't know what that is or or whatever, you know. It's so if because I've just found over the years that the more inner work I do, the more available I am for the people in my life, you know, including myself. And so if, you know, whatever tools that you have that work for you, you know, use your tools while you're in the middle of whatever it is, you know, and so if you're being able to be a witness, you know, for your friend or colleague or even your neighbor or acquaintance, um, it's, it's really valuable. And, yeah. and, you know, there are some of our people that are so hurting right now that they're angry. I mean, I've seen some posts. I've got a lot of Indigenous First Nations people's posts, you know, and they're just like, ah. and, um, and that's that hurt, you know, that hurt that's coming out and that's been suppressed for so, so long. Like we've known this, everybody who went through it, you know, has known it, whether they've suppressed the memories or not. And then our people have heard the stories, you know, within the families or friends. And, and it's been, we've had this awareness for a long time. And, and then to hear somebody say, well, it was a long time ago, you should just get over it. Um, that's, that's hurtful. And so, to be able to, to just have a witness who's not judging me and saying you should get over it or, okay, well, you've had your, your 15 minutes of crying now, you know, is it better yet? Um, you know, is, it's kind of like maybe not quite what we're going for there. And, um, but to have allies, you know, and, and to be an ally, is really to let yourself be educated and and not take it personal you know that's the other thing because like if, if if i'm taking something personal then i'm going into contraction again and i'm making it about me and you know and we hear these words of white fragility and it's like you know i'm not saying you hit me glenice you know <laughs> i know you didn't do that to me but I need to tell you about this because, you know, I know for myself, like I stuffed things for so long and it was in my mid twenties. And I finally went to, cause I'd been through ceremonies and I'd been through training programs. I've been through healing things. But when I finally went to a therapist and she said, okay, so this first session and however many sessions we need to do for you just to tell me your story, that's what we're going to do. And it took my first two sessions with her to get through the whole thing that I could even say at that point. And, um, you know, it was wonderful to have somebody that could just listen to me. And she leaked, you know, many times listening to my story and, um, and just to have somebody to listen to me and not have to interject anything. You know, she didn't even ask clarifying questions. She just said, you know, you know, is there anything else? And, um, and for me, that was just this huge weight that was lifted off because especially in the era in which I grew up, people kind of waited for you to take a breath so they could interject whatever their point of view was or to tell you where you were wrong or, you know, that kind of stuff. I mean, I was even told what I felt oh, no, you didn't feel that way. You felt this way, you know, like, so to have that, oh, somebody's just listening to me. What, but like, wow, um, kind of experience. And, and so that's a huge gift just to be able to listen, you know, and I would just encourage people to, you know, get some background information. There's lots of information. There's movies, there's um, interviews that the CBC did, a uh, whole thing up on the national um, that you can find through YouTube of, of people's stories. Um, I've got like tons of stuff. I even posted, there's a beautiful woman, um, Farrah Palmer. She's this gorgeous Cree woman who I knew her mom 
and her mom brought her to our office when she was like 12, 12 years old to sing. And this voice was just spectacular. And I thought, oh, a little bit more training and we're going to be like hearing from her. And not only was she a beautiful singer, but a writer of songs. And she wrote this beautiful song based on what the stories her mom told her about residential school. And uh, I dug up a performance she did at um, like the Canadian Music Awards, I think maybe the Aboriginal, I forget. But anyway, I posted it on my Facebook and, and it's just, you know, it's a heart wrenching, but beautiful and poignant um, song about children going to school and, and what a warrior her mom was, you know? And so we're not calling people residential school survivors. We're calling them resident. Well, and I don't even know if we're going to call them schools anymore, but those places, but there's the warriors of those places because they, you know, they kept going. And, and so, yeah, to, to really acknowledge the strength of the people who, who lived through all that. And, and many people have thrived and many people haven't. And, and the thing that's, um, you know, that's come up a lot as I've, you know, been reading my friends posts is just, you know, who would those children have been? You know, what leaders would they have been? And I guess the other thing that comes up for me and, you know, not to get all maudlin or anything, but just that, you know, that whole thing with lazy and loser and and all of that is like, you know, when you're dealing with post-traumatic stress syndrome, you know, who does great? You know, like there's some... I, I helped start a mentoring program down in California years ago, and I had to do all this research on it. And one of the things they found this is that if, if a child who went through troubling times had had a mentor, like even as little as one hour a week for about a year, nine months to a year, it was like an inoculant, you know, that helped them really yes, they'd have bumps in their lives, but they'd be able to move forward in a strong way. And, and, you know, people like Michael Jordan and other folks who, you know, had been through really rough childhoods, but because they had this mentoring, they were able to, you know, move forward. And, and I see that in my own life. I mean, I had my grandmother who was a steady influence and really, you know, gave me so much support. She wasn't a real warm, fuzzy person, but she, you know, she showed her love through other ways. And I had a ballet teacher who really just chubby little Indian kid shows up and she just saw me and she just every, she always caught me doing something right. And, uh, unlike the nuns who are always catching me doing everything wrong, and, you know, <laughs> it's a wonder. I, I mean, I went back and looked at all my report cards at one point and I had like the, my lowest grade was ever a C, but my, my internal projection was that I was a horrible student and that I spent all my time in the corner because <laughs> I was the little Indian kid, you know, in this sea of white children. And so, um, yeah, it was, it was hilarious. But anyway, so it's just that thing of like looking for the good in the people. And, and I remember years ago I was, uh, invited our, our, organization was invited to do it was a cross-cultural training for the Vancouver police and the RCMP in the area and so there were members of the Indo-Canadian community and the Chinese Canadian community and Aboriginal community and we went to the Italian Cultural Center in Vancouver and had this like day-long event or at least half the day and I remember sitting across from this um RCMP, I think he was a corporal. And, um, and I was dressed in my, you know, my business attire, because that's, you know, that was, that was the mask I was wearing that day. And, um, and he's sitting there and we're having this chat and he says, wow, Susan, I've just never met any, any Indian Aboriginal people like you. And I looked at him and I smiled and I said, well, you know, and I used to say, well, just say Daniel, I don't remember what it was. But I said, but you know, Daniel, I bet you have. And he looked at me and he's like, really? And I said, I bet you have. 
but in your mind's eye, you're thinking Indian is the guy in the back alley or the gal on the street corner or the people that you're going to their house to break up a problem, you know, or the petty theft person that you're arresting. That's who you see as Indian Aboriginal people. And he looked at me and he looked at me and then he sat back in his chair and I could just see the gears and the wheels turning in his head. And he just leaned forward and he said, oh my God, you're right. I said, because there's a lot of us, there's teachers and lawyers and judges and all kinds of professionals and people who work in banks and you know, people who are successful parents, and but you don't hear about those stories. And he just said, "Oh my God, I'm gonna, I'm gonna really try to look different from now on." And I said, yeah. "Thank you, you know, just thank you." And yeah. I've had those kind of chats with social workers, and you know, it just like it's one group I was invited to speak to, and I just said, "You know, you've graduated from social work school, and now you're gonna go out there and you're gonna go." work with these people but you gotta keep in mind like there's all this wounding that's happened and and so you're dealing with people who've been through all this stuff and they've never had healing and they're looking at me like and I just said okay so let's just imagine it's rush hour in Vancouver and you're cruising along and all of a sudden you're not cruising anymore and the traffic is all backed up and they're like, yeah. And I said, you've been through that. Yeah. And I said, so it's been a long time and you're waiting. And so you go, you get out of your car because nothing's moving. And, and you go and you look and you see that there's this bad accident. And there's somebody laying there in the middle of the road and the ambulance can't get through. And there's blood all around and you can even see a bone sticking out of one of their legs. And, and, and you don't walk up to them and kick them and say, get the hell out of the road. Do you see what you're doing? You're blocking traffic here. You are blocking traffic and you're making a mess and, and you're really messing things up and you shouldn't do that. You should get out of the way. And they're all looking at me like, well, what are you talking about? And I just said, yeah, people or people have wounds that you cannot see, but they're just as real, you know? And if you could just see with those kind of eyes, that when people come, they're not trying to milk the system. Some of them are, you got some like that, you know, but that didn't come out of nowhere. And so just keep that in mind, just do your best to keep that in mind. So when you're out on the street and you see somebody, you know, they didn't say one morning, hey, I think I'd like to, I think I'd like to go and be a homeless addict on the street. I think that'd really be fun. What, are the, what do you think, Harry? You want to come with me? <laughs> Hell yeah, let's go do it. You know, there's nothing like hanging out in a nasty back alley of downtown Vancouver, you know, to really bring your day up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Susan, I got to say that that is such a brilliant analogy. Such a brilliant analogy. Because you're right, nobody would go up and kick them and tell them to get out of the way. Like nobody would, and yet you're right. There's so many of of the people that have experienced the residential schools or had somebody in their life experience them. So it's, you know, this kind of ripple effect that are walking around with those protruding bones, so to speak, that we don't see. And like you say, I mean, then people have experiences and then they glump them all together and they say, well, this is what this group of people is like, or this is what this group of people is like. And I love that. Thank you so much for that. And really, guys, I wonder what might be possible if we were willing to just be present, just be present. Susan isn't asking you to make excuses for Susan's asking you just be present with who you're with. And, and maybe look through a different set of eyes. <laughs> now, I want to ask you, Jocelyn has asked a really great question. She said, if I genuinely feel sorry or sorrow for you or someone going through this, what's the best way, what's the best thing for me to say? Can you talk about the word sorry? Mm, yeah. Well, one of the things I've said to, you know, all the children that I've helped raise is that sorry 
has gotten overused and especially as Canadians, good Lord, I could bump into you and you guys say sorry for crying out loud, you know? So, <laughs> so, so what I, what I would say to my son, who is um, my stepson, both of his parents are Canadian, but he was born in the States and then I helped raise him and we're still friends to this day. Um, but I'd say, honey, you know, sometimes you know, a word gets overused and then it loses its meaning. So for little things, let's not say sorry, just say oops, you know? So if you if you did something and it wasn't quite right, you know, but you, it wasn't a big thing, just say oops. Then save the sorry for the big stuff. But I would say better than sorry is I apologize. You know, I, I apologize, you know, and I know that I didn't do those things, you know, I didn't do those things, but I'm part of a system that has benefited from all of those things, you know, and so I apologize. And for any part, you know, any of my ancestors might've played in that. I was talking to a friend the other day and she said, she, her family had slaves, you know, when you go back a few generations, her family had slaves and she's like, you know, how do I deal with that? And I said, yeah, right. How do you deal with that? And so I would just say, you know, I, I feel so bad. Like my heart hurts to hear all these things because I have a caring heart and I would never want any child to go through that. And I don't know what I can do, but if there is anything that I can do, you know, please let me know. And I'm going to do my best to educate myself. You know, I'm going to educate myself on the real history of what happened. And I'm going to, you know, push for the recommendations from the Truth and Reconciliation Com Commission to actually come to life. You know, and I'm going to I'm going to write the prime minister and I'm going to write my premier and I'm going to write my, you know, all my representatives. And I'm going to say, Hey, we've got to do better. And we can to this day, there are, I don't know, like 60 reserves on Canada in Canada that don't have drinking water. You can't turn on a tap and drink the water. That's like third world country conditions in Canada that prides itself on being so progressive and so together and, you know, sends money. I mean, the States isn't much better, you know? Um, I mean, my, my people, the Lakota are some, I mean, Geronimo, you know, woot woot, you know, but our people also, you know, along with the, our, our allies kick the U S government's butt, you know, and they've never forgotten that. You know, our, um, our res is one of the poorest counties in the whole of the United States. It's always in the top five or the lowest five, you know, so it's like, educate yourself and, and, and speak up, you know, like this is not right and we've got to do better and we can do better. And I demand that we do better because you're using my taxpayer money, dudes. You know, like I want us to do better and you're my representatives. So let's make it happen already. So Susan, is that the best way? Like I, you know, is, is writing the, the, you know, the prime minister and, and your MPs and representation, like, is, does that work? What, what do you suggest? Like, is, are there other ways that we can, we can do it also? Or is that, is that, does that actually work? Well, I think, you know, what I've heard over the years is that um, um, when people write a letter, to literally take the time to write a letter, because they know like a lot of people want to write that letter, but they don't write that letter, that that, you know, has more weight than just one letter. They're saying, oh, well, that's one person that's writing, but they're representing more people who are not literally going to pick that sucker up and stick the stamp on it, put it in the mail. And, um, and then calling, 
you know, you can always call. But if there's enough of an upswell, those politicians want to get back in there, dudes, you know. So they will listen if enough people start making a stink. And, you know, this whole thing with the graves being found now, they can't not do something. And I, I read an article that, you know, Trudeau has reached out to the Pope and said, you know, an apology with you here on Canadian land is going to mean more than you sending word from the Vatican. So it's, you know, there's enough of a groundswell. And I've been working with the missing and murdered indigenous women thing for years, years and years. And now finally there's enough of an upswell that more and more people, and it's even come across into the States. So now, and we have our new secretary of the interior, who's an indigenous woman, first one ever. And the secretary of the interior in the States is the one the, you know, the bureau that's, you know, got to do with First Nations people down here. So it's like, yay, you know, woot, woot, first time. Um, and a woman, woot, woot. So, um, yeah, it does make a difference, you know, and is it the only thing? No. I mean, certainly, um, you know, listening, I mean, joining gatherings, um, if you feel called to do that, to go and, and stand witness when there's a missing and murdered women's thing going on or, um, or a rally, you know, in support of residential school warriors, um, you know, just to be there, you know, you don't have to be all up and crazy and stuff, but just, just to show up, you know, and just quietly, just nod and, you know, because it's it's a thing. And also just a little heads up, like if if you're ever around First Nations people and and uh, and you go to shake hands, it's it's just touching hands. It's like a, a, a gentle, a gentle clasping. Like I was raised by my grandmother to not be one of those soft, wimpy southern girls who just touches and, you know, but that's literally like an indigenous <laughs> handshake is that. Um, so just, I don't know, that just popped in my head, but anyway, um, no, things are good. Can I ask another thing about that? I grew up in Turtleford, Saskatchewan. So Thunder Child First Nation Reserve is, is right yeah. there too. Um, and so I, I interacted and had lots of friends and boyfriends and had a lot of experience. And one of the things that I noticed was that eye contact was very different. Yes. Is, is, okay. Can you speak yeah. about that? Is that a cultural... Yes, it is. And boy, I can't tell you the number of cops I've spoken with over the years and cops in training is like, listen, it's a sign of respect not to be looking in each other's eyeballs like that. And um, whereas in in Western culture, it's a sign of you're being shifty and shady if you can't look me in the eye. And I've sat with, you know, so many elders and, and holy people and they'll look right past you, you know, if they, you know, or they'll look down or they'll look at something that they're holding and they'll speak because it is just this thing of respect. Now, there are people nowadays who are more comfortable looking in the eye. Um, but, yeah, don't ever take it personally if somebody's not looking you straight in your eyeballs because it's uh it's it's not done a lot you know in yeah. in on a lot of reses so yeah that's a great that's a great point this is one of those those things okay yeah. so i've been kind of taking notes so i just want to just go back for anybody who's listening now that maybe didn't join at the beginning um so some of the things that we can do every one of us it doesn't matter who you are every one of us can listen we can educate ourselves. We can take some form of action, whether we want to write the prime minister, our MPs, uh, other people that might have some say in that sort of stuff, join gatherings, um, be present, just be present with people. Look through a totally different eyes than maybe uh, what you've heard growing up and what you've you know, decided were your points of views about it. Is there anything else you would add to that, Susan? 
Hmm. You know, they could just just to contribute your energy on on the energetic level, whether you consider it a spiritual energy or or what have you, like um, just you know, from your heart to the heart of, of all the people who are. You know, just so sad right now. Um, I mean, I've literally listened to hundreds and hundreds and I've sat with people as they were getting ready to go to give their statement during the time of the truth and reconciliation. And um, and when they had to go, because the whole thing around um, getting compensation, you know, for having been through what they've been through. And so then you have to go talk about it and, and give details, like as many details as you can. And then they base that on how, how much money you get is like how traumatized they think you were. <laughs> it's just like insanity. And, and, um, and so just that, uh, that sense of like the wound getting opened and and but what i know about the healing process is the wound has to get opened and cleaned out because until you get all the gunk out it's still going to fester in there and and so all the social ills that we've seen are, is is that festering and so you know, just, just put your energy out of like, what else is possible? And, and one of the things that I offer with people in, in my medicine wheel workshops and trainings and stuff is, is like, let's imagine one day that you come home. It's been a perfectly fine day, but you come home and there's a big pile, a steaming pile of horse shit in your living room and you didn't put it there, but there it is. And um, so you got some options there. You could just put a clothespin on your nose and walk around and act like it's not there. And over time, it'll dry and it'll shrink, you know, but it's still going to be there, but it's going to dry. But then, you know, it'll dry and then it's kind of flies around and sticks on you and it's just all, ugh, you know. Um, or you can just go, well, darn it all. I didn't put it here. You know, somebody else has got to come and clean it up. And, well, that's not going to work either because nobody else wants to put their paws in the horse poo. <laughs> so, you know, what are you going to do? It's well, I'm going to roll up my sleeves and I'm going to get some buckets and whatever I can and get that stuff out of here. And if you take a pile as a gardener, I know that when you take a pile of horse poo and you put it out on the earth, the earth does something really wonderful with that poo. But if you just leave it inside, it's just a honking, stinky, nasty mess. And so I'm sure each one of you listening to this has received some proper poo in your lives of whatever ilk, you know, and whatever, you know, because like whatever doesn't get dealt with gets passed on, you know, and even in the Bible, they talk about it, the sins of the father will be Pat, you know, visited upon the sun. And it's not, and sin, the ancient word of sin, because um, they translated from Aramaic into Greek and on and on. Um, sin, one of the meanings of the word sin is mistake. It literally means to miss the mark. And so the sin is if I made mistakes and I don't deal with it, it gets passed on because kids pick up stuff from us. And so that's what we've seen the, you know, going through the generations of the stuff that didn't get healed, you know, the mistakes that those Catholics and Anglicans and even Mormons and whoever, you know, passed on to our ancestors got passed on. And then, you know, and now we're seeing those social ills in our time today, but we got to take that horse manure and put it out and because it's going to make beautiful flowers and beautiful vegetables and happy, healthy, you know, fruit trees and such the like. And so 
that's the beauty of it. So take it, put it where it belongs, and which is my long-winded way of saying, go out to the earth <laughs> and just say, Mother Earth, a lot of crap has gone on here and I don't even know what exactly to do about it. But I know you do because you're the great recycler. So take this energy that needs recycling and recycle it and make it something into beautiful for us. And I'll do everything I can to contribute and just put your sweet little paws, you know, from your heart onto the earth and just, just send it out, you know, in all the directions and let it bless everybody and it'll come back and it'll, then you can let it be multiplied and go back out there again, you know, cause this, you know, is now the time. Oh yeah. You know, cause it's all coming out. It's yeah. all coming out. And, and I'm sure there's more and there'll be more tears, but we can do this. You know, we're big, we're mighty. We got yeah. this, you know, but we, we've got each other's backs and the universe has our back. And Mother Earth has our back. And, you know, having the backs just keeps going on and on and on. You know. Wow. I love that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now I have a question. And then um, I'd just like to take a moment for before we end for all the warriors. Uh, but my question is, I will be honest, a little bit embarrassing. And you've used all the words. So I'm just not sure if you can give me some insight. Um, Native, Indigenous, Indian, First Nations. What What is the appropriate term? And are they do they mean different things? Like, again, I'm embarrassed to ask, but I'm going to because that's what I'm here for. Yep. Absolutely. Well, and, and it's, um, it's a good question because people even like, you know, our people like, like, how do I say it? Like Lakota is, is our word for ourselves and Dakota and Nakota. Um, but and then, but then my band in the Lakota is Ogallala. And our tribal council is the Ogallala Sioux. And Sioux is um, a, like a shortening of a, of a Anishinaabeg word that actually literally means enemy, little enemy. <laughs> and so it's a Frenchified version shortening of it and um and so it's just what people kind of get used to saying so technically like first nations has to do with like like the the nation to nation like uh because because there are treaties and treaties are only done between nations okay. so canada has treaties and so at least in the united states they're actually a treaty is more sacred than even the constitution Interestingly, the United States has broken every treaty they've ever made with us. Go figure. Um, so, um, and then um, uh, Aboriginal is kind of like like blanketing, and and Indigenous is also because Indigenous means of this place, you know. So Indigenous to this place, um, and Aboriginal is technically like like uh because it's original and it's and it's not doesn't mean like a something means not but it's ab which is like kind of even like before original like like okay. really original and so the original people of the land and um but what's really awesome is if you can find out like what nation is the person from um, you know, and what, whenever I gather in a circle with people, I'll ask them, you know, and it's first nations or non first nations, indigenous people or non, you know, everybody, I just say, so, uh, what, what's your name? Who are you? Where are your ancestors from? Where are your ancestors from? And, uh, how come are you here? Like, <laughs> why you're here today and so then that way I can find out and, and people who've worked together for years are suddenly finding I didn't know you were part Italian you know so it's just a really cool thing and a lot of people have um, like tried to glom on to learning about 
you know, traditional Aboriginal First Nations spirituality because it's so connected to here. And most, uh, you know, settlers, colonizers have come from other places and they're so disconnected from their roots and their ancestors that that it feels so good to be in a native ceremony, as it were, um, because it is connected and it's a real thing. So, um, so there's that kind of that desire for that. So, so if, but if you can find out like the na- like the name of that first nation, that person that with whom you're speaking, then you can circumvent the whole thing. So we're Aboriginal indigenous, like, I don't know. Um, and then the Inuit people are all like you Southerners, you know, like, <laughs> we are not your kind of people. We are our kind of people. Right? You know, like for some of us up in the Arctic, he was like, yeah, you Southerners, let's think, okay, I get it. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. Um, so I, I would like to just take a moment and, and honor the warriors, the warriors who were able to walk away, yeah. the warriors who weren't, the warriors that we have yet to find in those graves that I know is coming more. Um, do you have any suggestion of how to do that right now as a group? Is that, I mean, we um, can just take a moment of silence, but if you have something. Well, I have a song um, I learned from the Mi'kmaq people. They're the people of the dawn. And I was it had the great good fortune. It was a sad event, but I was able to stay with them um, years ago in New Brunswick. And it's, it's their honor song. And another time where my heart leaked through my eyes it was, was to be in a, a, a gymnasium of at least 300 people and they were all singing the song. And if you can imagine that. And so I went to them and in our way, you you do not hear a song and you go, hey, great song, I'm gonna learn that. And then you take it away with you. Um, as one elder from Heshkwit said, when you're with me, you can sing my songs and you can sing these songs in the shower. And you can sing when you're alone driving down the road, but you cannot sing these songs in public because they do not belong to you. So I, you know, and having known that, I went to these elders um, and I offered them blankets and tobacco. And I said, in the old days, as a Lakota woman, I would be bringing you a herd of horses to ask for permission to sing your song. Um, But I'm a poor modern woman and all that many blankets and they were very honored they were like you want to learn our song oh my gosh yes please so what this song says it's an honor song and it's kind of like their national anthem like the um Slewatooth people in north vancouver have theirs beautiful song too but it's um it means that when we all stand together that's when we're strong when we all stand together that's when we, we can do what we're here to do so i offer this song for, for all the warriors and um and the ancestors and the people, their descendants, the ones living now, um, anyone who's having a tough time through all of this, um, and for everybody listening, just that, you know, we're all part, like, it just looks like you, and it just looks like you, and it just looks like you if we're looking with these physical eyes, but you are the ambassador for all your ancestors, you know, and so, um, and just singing this for for those in, in honor of our warriors here. So I'll sing this in the best way that I can. Get me down I 
Thank you so much, Susan. I'm so grateful for you and this conversation and truly what else is possible that we've never even considered. Yeah. <sighs> and, and in the West Coast area of where I'm staying, it's, um, they lift their hands in gratitude. You know? And so I lift my hands in gratitude, Glenice, that that you open the space for a conversation that you were in the question and uh and open and to everyone who's joining either now or in the future you know my hands up to you that you are you know have an open heart and an open mind and um you know may this be a contribution to the healing of all our relations yeah thank you Thank you. Thank you. So if anybody would like to reach out to Susan, how is the best way? Um, well, I'm on Facebook, Susan Powell. Um, and my, uh, my poorly neglected uh, page that you, because there's a lot of Susan Powell's out there, but um, uh, my poorly neglected page, the, I'll be better about it, but it's um, Medicine Wheels and More. And so you could even send me a message through that. That's pretty easy. So, um, yeah, we'll put we'll put some links in in the in the comments section stuff, guys. This will also be made into the podcast for this week, so they'll be in the show notes and everything. So, um, just again, thank you, Susan. Thank you, and thank you everybody for being here now and in the future. And ah, let's go be the change. Let's go be the change, guys. Let's do it. Awesome. Yay. Thank you. <laughs>